My father never loved me as a child, mainly because he was an adult when I was born. <laughs> and some of you won't get that till you're on the way home. That's my style of humor, and uh, you kind of have to be sharp. So, um, Eric and Cindy are dear friends of ours. We've adopted them. They're in our will. We'll leave them a significant portion of our bills. And... Uh, of course, their, their children are our grandchildren whom we love and adore. And uh, if you're watching Carter and Dakota, I love you, we love you, Guam loves you. So uh, Eric had texted me, uh, most of the time when I travel I teach something from the Hebrew Bible or Hebrew scriptures, that's kind of my genre or multiculturalism. But he asked me to speak to you about failing without being a failure. So uh, my wife and I live in a 55-plus uh, retirement community that has its own swimming pool. And you have to, with COVID now, you have to make an appointment to go swimming. And so we go there. We had 150 days in a row where it was above 100 degrees down there in Southern California this year, set a record. And we'd go sit in the pool, just kind of to cool things off. And then I told her about this message, and so, boy, what a blessing to have a Christian therapist counselor for a wife. Uh, you know, so, you know, more than half this message is the wisdom from my wife telling me how to fail without becoming a failure. And in the process, pointing out all my failures. <laughs> Not really. Uh, it was really, it was really good. So, uh, you know, I... As a theologian, I have, to, I have a tendency to focus on the thinking process. And, of course, as a therapist, she focuses on the feeling process. And so I feel that uh, she doesn't think enough, and she thinks I don't feel enough. So we get along. It's a great relationship. So failing without being a failure. And... Uh, so it gave me a lot of time to think about my own life as I come into this. How, how do I look for 79? I'm not 79. I was just wondering how I look, look for 79. <laughs> so um, as uh, Pastor Eric said, I had major surgery. It was actually in April. Uh, cancer surgery. I had uh, most of my esophagus taken out and a third of my stomach, and then they took my stomach and made a new esophagus out of it. And, uh, and so I'm only two-thirds of the man I was last time I was here. I lost a lot of excess weight and baggage, which was good for me. But uh, the recovery is very slow. But they got all the cancer. Amen. And... Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, but, as, uh, you know, those of you that have had surgery understand that there's really interesting things that occur. And I was in the University of Southern California Hospital in San Diego, which is known for its esophageal cancer surgery. People come from all over the world because they're so successful. Five and a half hour surgery. There were 30 people in the surgery suite, and plus a robot. I was operated on by a robot. And uh, so I had to go out and find a new mechanic in order to sue it. <laughs> Some of you will never get that. That's, that's okay. But anyway, because COVID was going on, they had a special... Uh, recovery suites for those who had had surgery. And uh, of course, when you come out of surgery, there's, there's a tube coming out of every orifice in your body, plus the, whatever orifice they, they created during the surgery, which was 11 different holes in my body. 
including an inch and a half uh, hose thing that was stuck in through my ribs in the side that had, they had to deflate my lung to, to fit it in there. And so you come to uh, out of anesthesia and there is, I'm in this room and there's all kinds of noises. Beep, 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 tick, 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 ding, 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 ding. You know, so, of course, those are all their machines that are, you know, monitoring you and helping you breathe and all that sort of thing. So they had a TV in there, and they had it on, I think, to kind of help me not be so distracted by these medical sounds. But when I woke up, the, I looked at the TV, and it was Mike Lindell selling me uh, my pillow. which the hospital had obviously not purchased. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can only watch the, the selling of a pillow so long, and then the plot gets really thin. <laughs> and there's no chase scenes, and uh, the music was horrible, and uh, so I the nurse was there and I said, can, can I watch something different on the TV, like something like sports? Oh, sure. Well, then I slipped back to being unconscious again for several more hours. And uh, then I came back into my consciousness and myself and I looked at the TV. And you wouldn't believe it. I was watching Sewing with Nancy. <laughs> now, I'm not opposed to sewing or Nancy or anyone named Nancy. But uh, I was like, hey nurse, can we find Mike Lindell again? <laughs> so that's my recovery story. <laughs> but for those of you who knew about our situation, thank you so much for your prayers. I looked up uh, the de dictionary definition of failure, and the, the, the simple short version is the lack of success. So I thought, well, I should look up the def dictionary definition of the word success then. And th that definition is the accomplishment of an aim or purpose. Now, we live in this strange Western culture society where we have things divided into two things. Uh, we're, we're polarized uh, by right and left, light and dark. Re bless you. Republican, uh, Democrat, uh, you know, uh, conservative, liberal. Uh, someone said there's only two kinds of people in the world, those who divide people into two kinds and those who don't. <laughs> and uh, so as a native, you know, understanding a multicultural experience in the faith realm, uh, there's not just two sides to everything. I think modern culture has limited experiences to being successful and unsuccessful. That's not true, but if you look at our sports world, um, you can have the winner of the Super Bowl. I mean, and the other team is the loser. They don't get a parade. I mean, they made the Super Bowl. Or like the World Series. You know, we're going to remember who won the World Series, Dodgers. <laughs> the only bit of prophecy I have in me. So if it turns out to be wrong, you know. Not my fault. It's the Dodgers' fault. But yeah, we have a tendency to praise the winner. We praise those who are successful. I don't believe the opposite of success is failure. I believe the opposite of success is unsuccessful. And that allows for many options to exist that will move any effort from unsuccessful to successful. And that will require adjustments and change and work It'll require reflection. It'll require some type of inventory. Vince Lombardi, the great 
football coach said, the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. For most of us, success is not going to be handed to us. You've been gifted. Everyone in the room is gifted. Everyone watching is gifted. And those gifts were handed to you, administered by the Ruach HaKodesh, commonly known as the Holy Spirit. He is the administrator of the gifts. But the success in manifesting those gifts generally requires work. To understand the gift, how it works, where it works, where it doesn't work, those kinds of things. And so let me give you a little bit of native wisdom this morning. Never judge a man until you've walked a mile in their moccasins. And, of course, the wisdom is that way you'll be a mile away when you have their moccasins. <laughs> it's not about judging the person. It's about getting new moccasins. <laughs> These lower 48 natives, I love them all, have this wisdom that says, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish... You feed him for the rest of his life. We in Alaska have a corollary to that wisdom, and we say that if you build a fire, you heat a man for a day. But if you light that man on fire, you heat him for the rest of his life. It's not right, but it's funny. Got to watch out for some of this native wisdom. <laughs> but wisdom says, and I'll say this as the first thing, failure is only the end if we let it be. It's only the end if we let it be. We fall into despair and hopelessness so easily, and that is because we live in an affluent culture. I'll let that sink in a moment. And when our affluence is being challenged as it is now, you can see how quickly discontent has set in and hopelessness and despair. Cindy was telling me about an experience that was just put on social media of a seven-year-old boy who committed suicide, hung himself. How do seven-year-olds even know what suicide is? Or how hopeless is that boy's situation that for him the only out was death? Failure is only the end when we let it be. Secondly, and Eric mentioned this, when you pick up a stick, and this is one of the native wisdoms that we teach our children, when you pick up a stick, you pick up both ends. When we ask native children in Alaska which end of the harpoon is the most important, they usually answer, the pointy end. But think about it. So what if you stick the pointy end into a walrus? How do you get the walrus back to your kayak? Without the tether, which is on the other end. How successful is an arrow without the feathers on the other end? Most of us, when we got married, we only picked up the good end of marriage. And then a little later on, it didn't take too long, we found out there's another end to that stick. We picked up the good end of the job we got. 
And after we worked there a little while, we found out there was another end to that stick called tedium, called co-workers, bosses, customers. Aren't they the worst? We have a saying in Alaska, spend $5,000 and go home. <laughs> Just spend it and get out of here, you know? Because that's the other end of the stick for us, called tourism. Yeah. What did W.C. Fields used to say? Go away, you bother me. <laughs> Yeah, the universal belief is that we can only pick up the good end of a stick. And it's not true. And we have to learn it. And we have to recognize it. And we have to adjust our lives to accept it. Number three, this is very important. Don't be overcommitted to things you're not committed to. That's why so many of us men who as boys had unfinished model airplanes in the closet. Dad, get me that model airplane. Why? Because at the moment we were overcommitted to it. I won't talk about what girls have in their closets because I don't know. <laughs> when I approached a, a book editor up after I'd written my first book, happened to be a lady, and it was a Christian publisher, Christian book publisher, and she said this to me, and I've never forgotten it, that of 400 Christian books, that are begun, only one is completed. Let me say that again. Of 400 Christian books that are begun, only one is completed. And if you ask all 400 of those authors, they'll likely say God told them to write that book or inspired them to write that book. But they're overcommitted to things they're not committed to. I have a practice in my life, and the reason I can finish the books that I write is because I write one hour a day. But even if I want to write longer, I don't. Because it's, if I go past that hour, I'm likely, likely not going to write good stuff, meaningful stuff. It's that part of getting caught up in the moment. I know some of you might be dating in this room and some of you who are watching are, you know, fishing. Well, don't be overcommitted to things you're not committed to. Let the one who knows what relationship and networking and marriage is really all about. Let Yahweh have some input into that commitment. Yeshua, Jesus, put it in a very practical way. He said that anyone who is going to build a bridge actually sits down and counts the cost first. Because if you build a bridge halfway, Neither side can cross it. It's useless. It's being overcommitted to something we're not committed to. And that will really lead to being unsuccessful in many of our endeavors. Number four, try many things. I'm an artist, so I try a lot of different art expressions. One of the things that I tried was pottery. And I really appreciate good pottery, creative pottery. But I didn't like it. 
I didn't like the messiness of it. Just, there was just some, it wasn't me. I can carve ivory, but that's different from putting your hands in this watery mud thing. I couldn't do that. And so I didn't become a potterer. Like I say, those that can do pottery well, I really admire them and appreciate their work. But I tried it, and it wasn't me. As an artist, I've thrown away many paintings. Why? Because they didn't meet my standard. If they didn't please me, I didn't want them to displease others. You have to try these things. They may work and they don't work. But these efforts, which we would consider unsuccessful, an unsuccessful painting, but they are a learning tool, aren't they? From those unsuccessful paintings, I learned what not to do in a painting, which can be as important as learning what to do. You know, the hardest part about painting is learning when you've made the last brush stroke. And I've ruined many paintings not knowing that I had already made the last brush stroke. And whatever I did after that ended up ruining the effort. Know when to stop. I'm not going to die in the pulpit. Jesus and the Apostle Paul both said, I've finished the work you gave me to do. I'm going to be a painter and a writer, and I'm going to fish and visit my grandkids and my 13 great-grandkids, and I'm not going to die doing this. Why? Because there's another generation coming after me, and if I don't get out of the way, how do they succeed? So we got a bunch of old, fuddy-duddy religious guys and women traveling around the country that refuse to get off the path and let the next generation, who's going to know all this new social media and the different ways to get the message out further than we ever thought. And they'll be hampered from doing it because some of us don't want to stop. No, know when you've made the last brush stroke in your life. I want to be, at some point, just an elder for you. Just a source of some wisdom and some experience and some help. But not your teacher anymore. Not your scholar. Not your one who's coming up with messages. Just want to be Sukina. Let me give you some examples of those who tried many things. Thomas Alva Edison had to try 1,000 different metals before he came up with tungsten to make the light bulb work. Now, if he had been a quitter or overcommitted to things he was not committed to, he'd have probably stopped at the 40th metal and said, oh, there's no metals out there that'll work. And we still wouldn't have a light bulb, would we? How many of you have ever heard of the financial guru, Dave Ramsey? You heard of him? Financial peace is his ministry or his uh, product, shall we say, his mission. Did you know he went bankrupt at age 26? And that's what spurred him on to learn the processes of becoming financially successful and then pass it on to the rest of the body of Messiah. MC Hammer, can't touch this, <laughs> was $13 million in debt when he filed for bankruptcy. Now he's still worth millions because he tried something else. Walt Disney went bankrupt when he turned 20. 20. 
and went bankrupt six more times before he became the successful person who has entertained most of us in this room and those watching on this program. George Foreman went bankrupt before selling the grill and now he's worth $300 million. You know, we had Steve Jobs, and now he's gone. We had Tom Petty, and now he's gone. We had Johnny Cash, and now he's gone. And we had Bob Hope, and now he's gone. So now we have no jobs, no petty cash, and no hope. <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did you? There was an article that was released this past Friday, and I came across it, and it's from Steve Jobs. And it fits so well in this message that I copied it down. He achieved massive success as the co-founder of Apple, but he was also no stranger to massive failure. He was actually fired as the founder of Apple when he turned 30. <laughs> Then after they rehired him, he launched a, a number of failures. Some of you in this room are too young to remember the Apple Lisa or the Macintosh TV or the Apple III or the Power Mac G4 Cube. Just the titles of those things alone, none of them are things that are attractive to me. He had screwed up big time and often, but there's a bigger lesson. This is what he said in 1994 in an interview. Most people never pick up the phone. Most people never call and ask for help. And that's what separates sometimes the people who do things from those who just dream about doing them. You gotta act. You gotta be willing to fail. You gotta be willing to crash and burn. With people on the phone or starting a company, if you're afraid you'll fail, you won't get very far. So challenge the inner monologue in your head by reframing. For example, write down three alternative ways of viewing a situation. Go to work tomorrow and act as if at least one of those alternatives is correct. Happiness and success are ignited when our inner environment is freed from negative assumptions. Countering destructive, now I'll interrupt here to say as a painter, and almost all artists know this, that there's a spot when you're painting a painting when it looks like an abysmal failure. And you have to push past that point to get to a successful painting. But it happens in every painting. You get to a spot and you just go, this isn't working. That's a negative assumption that it's not gonna work. Countering destructive thoughts makes us better friends to ourselves and more desirable partners, colleagues, and co-workers. So Yeshua was a rabbi of a synagogue of 12 people. Was he a ministerial failure? Moses killed an Egyptian. Was he a failure? David messed around with Bathsheba. Was he a failure? Well, yeah, he was a moral failure. But it didn't stop him from going on to being David, the man after Yah's own heart. Was the woman caught in adultery in John 8 a failure? 
The Pharisees thought so. You know what that passage in the Bible doesn't tell us? It doesn't tell us any of the circumstances in her life. It doesn't tell us if she was married and cheating on her husband. It doesn't tell us if she was a widow and most widows in Israel had to give their bodies away in order to survive in that culture. We know nothing of the circumstances, but you know who knew her circumstances? Yeshua. He looked at her and that story from a totally different perspective. And he didn't see her as a failure. It's an interesting story. A story that I greatly admire. That's misrepresented a lot of times from the pulpit. They brought this woman caught in the very act of adultery, threw her naked at the feet of Yeshua. Knowing him, he probably took his tallit off and covered her up to restore some sense of propriety and dignity. Moses said, stone her, what do you say? He not only knew her circumstances, he knew their circumstances. He knew their hearts, what the objective was. And so many pastors say, we don't know what he wrote on the ground. Maybe he wrote the names of all those people. We don't know. Well, they haven't read the Old Testament because the Old Testament tells you what he could write and what he couldn't write. Simple as that. Moses said the accusation of adultery is so significant and severe that it cannot be done by verbal accusation alone. It must also be in writing. So when they made the verbal accusation, the only choice he had, because he didn't come to destroy Moses, he said, was to bend down and write the accusation on the ground. Now he had fulfilled Moses, and now they were all the lawbreakers. So said, if you're without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. And this rock came flying over from the back and landed at the feet of Yeshua. And I know this part isn't in your English Bible. It's in the Hebrew Scriptures. But he went, Mom. <laughs> and that's for all you Catholics. former Catholics or online Catholics. So, they leave. Woman, where are your accusers? And she says, sir, they all all went away. Now, the English Bible supplies a couple sentences that aren't there because they're gestures. So they can only be described in sentences if we're going to understand them. But he doesn't speak. (laughs) It's an interesting thing. Woman, where are your accusers? Oh, they've all gone away. Well, here's the first gesture. Translated, neither do I condemn you. Then we have a gesture that all the mothers in this room know from experience. Probably didn't come from the Hebrew culture. It probably came from being mothers. It's this. <laughs> You've done that to your children and to your spouses. <laughs> Translate it. Go on your way. We're done here. No lecture. No follow-up. No counseling. No tell me what you've really done. No. Do you suppose we as believers could learn this? In our culture? 
Oh, I know your politics, but we're done here. No lecture. Go on your way. Never judge a man until you've walked a mile in their moccasins. That's how you get new moccasins. <laughs> the ends of a stick that we pick up are called successful and unsuccessful. We pick up both ends. But what we do with them will determine if we reach our aims and our purposes. Pick up the stick of this message. Both ends. The good end and the other end, which is how much better it could have been if someone else had preached it. <laughs> I'd sure like to hear Chuck Swindoll preach that. Franklin Graham. No, you just had this Inuit from Nome, Alaska called Sukina. But today it was my turn to pick up the stick and you got both ends. I am living now in the end of the stick of my life called I'm not young anymore. You picked up that stick of your life when you were born. That end of the stick is coming, folks. What am I going to do with it? What is my goal? What is my aim? What is my purpose? I can't change and be 40 again. I can remember when my waist was 40. But I'm not going to be 40 again. So I'm on that end of the stick. And as Paul Harvey would say, and that's the way it is. Please check out our resource table. Back there, there are things there you cannot live without. And that's the truth. I'm going to close with a song, if I can remember what I was told. I have a great memory. It's just short. <laughs> I've asked if I could do this, so don't. Oh, yeah, here's my helper. There's a thing on the here. Oh, okay. That solved that. Oh, can you help me? Yeah. I can't. Oh. oh. Bad ribs. Uh. So. I write songs every once in a while. Some of them are successful. The vast majority are unsuccessful. Uh, I wrote a song called An Anthem of Praise to Israel for the defeat of the Amalekites and the fall of the walls of Jericho. It goes like this. Now I just need some lyrics. Most people get the title after they've written a song. So sometimes we get titles and then the song just never arrives, you know. So I would like you to stand with me and, and pastor or whoever's closing this today. When I'm done with this song, I'm, I'm done. All right. It's a very simple song 
And I'll just sing that first line for you and then you'll, you'll pick it up. It goes like this. Oh, draw me. here this morning or those that are watching we're also his body all right so now we're just going to change the words and it's going to be oh draw us and think of us as his family his body his sanctuary remember one time this person complained to the pastor that the Somebody was chewing gum in the sanctuary. He said, no, the sanctuary is chewing gum. (laughs) We're the sanctuary. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the sanctuary. And when you leave here, you leave the building, the sanctuary here. But you, the sanctuary, walk down the street. So, oh, draw us. All right, here we go. Oh, draw us. the prophetic act. I want some of you people to stay facing this way. Some of you people turn and face that way. Some of you turn and face that wall. And some in the back turn and face the back. Because we're going to prophesy to those outside these four walls. And our prophecy is, oh, draw them, Lord. And they'll run after you. All right? Awesome. Thanks so much, Sakina. Let's give him one more hand. That was just a good word, huh? Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.